coming in now. Okay. We're good. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the regular council meeting for the town of High River at 3 p.m. on Monday, December 13th, 2021. I'll call to order the meeting at 3 p.m. Um, with uh, an adoption of the agenda that's been presented to us. If I can ask uh, for one of the councillors, please, to give me a motion for the adoption of that agenda. I can only see a few hands. So if you uh, put your hand up. Um, oh, there's. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. Appreciate it. I've got, so everybody knows I've got everybody's name on my right hand side. So if you virtually put that little hand up, if everybody knows how to do that, that'd be great. Otherwise, um, I'm going to have to flip between screens here just to see actual hands. But um, yeah, okay. That's uh, uh, the adoption of the agenda from Councillor Walsh. Thank you. Um, and moving to the adoption of the minutes from November 22nd, 21, uh, for the regular minutes, uh, November 22nd, 21, the closed special meeting minutes, and also the strategic priorities chart. And we'll have this by omnibus motion if I can have. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Uh, next item, public comments. Um, Jody, do we have any public comments at this time? There are no public comments right now. Thank you very much. Moving from public comments then, we will go right into a delegation. We have the Foothills Tourism delegation with us today. And I believe we have James Sauter and Veronica, uh, I'm gonna, uh, Kloiber. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. So. Um, we'll move to that delegation for presentation. I hope I got that right, Veronica. You did. Thank you. I should have coached you prior. I usually give people that courtesy. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us. I don't see. I'm here. Tough. He's here. Thank goodness. <laughs> we don't want to be alone. Um, so yeah, you are the second municipality we are presenting to. And we are here to present our most recent offer that is a detailed data platform for the Foothills region. So Foothills Tourism operates as a regional model. And if you go on our website, which I can put in the chat afterwards, we've done a study back in 2020, uh, sorry, 2020, it's called Unlocking the Foothills Region Tourism Potential. And in that study, it pointed out that a collective effort is needed to drive tourism, which is sort of where we're, our, our motto. Um, visitors don't notice municipal boundaries and are looking for at minimum a day long adventure within our foothills region, which spans from Bragg Creek, south to Nanton, and then Kananaskis to just east of Okotoks. Um, so COVID has changed our landscape quite a bit and all tourism associations had to shift quickly to a different audience. And we chose to pursue this data project that shows who visits our region, when, for how long, and from where. And I would love to pass this over to James because this is the bulk of what we want to show you today. For sure. Thank you, Veronica. Uh, can everybody see my screen? I'm sure right now the screen is black, at least on my computer. All right. I just I just did this and it should be good. <laughs> there we go. We've got yeah, we've got your full computer screen right now. Okay, great, great. You know, I'm not gonna go into presentation mode um only because I think um things are just a little funny. That that the delay there kind of scared me. So I'll just keep it in this current format. Um, and thank you, Ron, again, thank you everybody for um, allowing us to, to, to you know, share this time with you today. Um, you know, as, um, as, as you know, many of you may know, you know, the, the, um, the pandemic has hit the tourism industry pretty hard. Um, and, and what that's leaving um, a lot of the destination marketing organizations out there with is, is really a need for critical insights. Um, when we talk about those critical insights, what we're talking about is an understanding of economic impact, right? What is that um, that that impact that the pandemic has had, um, and how are our destinations recovering from it? 
Um, also understanding how receptive residents are um, to, to, to welcoming tourists back to their region, right? A very hot topic. Um, understanding, you know, how, you know, satisfied travelers are from the experience. A lot of these experiences, whether they're be in museums or, or indoor, um, you know, attractions have had to, you know, you know, basically reinvent their experience because of COVID and introduce new measures, you know, social distancing, masks, um, sanitization, electronic ticketing, you know, whatever lineups. Um, but there's also a very, um, another really critical insight and that's understanding the behavior of visitors. You know, where are they coming from and, and how long are they staying and, and what are they doing when they visit? And that's the, those are the insights that we're trying to focus on um, with this program. So a lot of those, those other um, insights, whether it be economic impact residents and, and traveler satisfaction, those are really addressed um, a lot from, from a provincial or national level DMO. So Destination Canada or Travel Alberta would be providing those types of insights, but it, it presents a bit of a gap um, in the knowledge when you're looking at a, a region like the foothills. Um, and this data comes to serve um, and fill that gap. Um, so what we're talking about specifically is, is a program that was made possible through a grant uh, from the Western Economic Di Diversification. Um, and it's, it's about providing mobile location data um, to the you know, Foothills communities, as well as uh, 270 Foothill tourism businesses. Um, um, and this is provided to them through a dashboard. If you're not familiar with mobile location data, this is data that's collected through the use of apps. So when um, an app developer, right, um, they build an app um, and then you, you know, we as consumers will download that app on our phone, we're triggered with a, um, a setting, you know, allow our data to be shared, our location data to be shared, um, uh, you know, all the time, never, only when I use the app. And hang on, let me share, let me, there we go. That might be better. Um, and 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 when when you choose to share that data, whether it be only some of the time or all of the time, that's the data that um, the you know app developer um, then sells to a data aggregator. Um, we purchase the data from a data aggregator. That data is um, you know latitude, longitude coordinates, a device ID, and a timestamp, so we understand when that signal was detected and where it was detected. And through a combination of business logic and business, you know, data transformation, we, we use that data to understand where visitors are coming from, right? What are they doing and so on. And so that dashboard right now is, is, is going to be made available through the Foothills Tourism Industry website. Um, it is actually uh, operating right now and we're just actually launching it on the website with the help of Freshly Pressed, another ad agency. Uh, there's going to be a series of training programs, videos, and, and webinars um, that will be also available for the local businesses to tap into. Um, just to kind of get into it in a little bit more detail. So, so what does this mean? What kind of insights are they gonna be able to draw and how is it gonna help their business? Um, ultimately, understanding um, traveler behavior is key, right? How long are they staying? Where are they coming from? When are they arriving in destination? When we talk about when are they arriving, it's like what day of the week and what time of day, right? Are they coming in and how can we devise strategies so that they stay longer, come earlier, do more, spend more, all of that kind of stuff. That's where the value of this data really comes in. Um, it also helps for identifying and targeting high value travelers. So by understanding where the travelers that spend the, the, the most amount of time in your destination are, you'll be able to kind of tailor your marketing activity accordingly. So more effective use of marketing. Um, and then just general messaging and packaging strategies. So when we say packaging strategies, that's really kind of like building out itineraries, right? And, and, and putting like-minded um, activities and, and attractions together um, for the, the right audience, right? That, that are doing. So understanding what they're doing and where they come from allows us to tailor the messaging and the media into those regions. Um, so all of this ultimately uh, really helps destinations, um, communities, businesses um, that are focused in tourism um, you know, accelerate the recovery. At this point, um, I might just open it up for questions. Uh, Veronica, unless there's anything you want to add. There might, well, there is. Um, I don't think Foothills Tourism, I'm just the recent president. I've been with the association since June 2020, but I've just recently taken the, the role of president. And I don't believe we've had a chance to present to High River Council ever. Um, so historically, what we've requested from municipalities is $200 per business, and that would put High River, and I'm happy to work with your administration to cross-reference that the businesses are indeed still in existence, 
the way that we get our business data is through Travel Alberta. It's um, the Alberta, it's called ATIS, Alberta Travel Information System. And so businesses can upload to that. And then the Foothills Tourism website automatically pulls onto our site. And there are real people working provincially to cross-reference and make sure the businesses are indeed active and have the best listing possible. So currently on our website, we have 46 businesses listed for High River, and that will put you in about the $9,000 mark. So that, that is our request to the town of High River and High River Council. And it is a discussion, uh, a discussion beginning, uh, we, can, we can discuss this. Um, and yeah, I'd just like to know if anyone on council or administration has questions about how Foothills Tourism started or operates. I'll leave that well, to you. For, first, first off, I'm just going to jump in and thank you guys, Veronica and James, for presenting to us today. Um, as a point of clarification, the, your organization has presented to us in the past. Um, so we've had presentations from you previously. Um, we do have a number of, of new councillors this year, so I'm, I'm sure they're finding this, this interesting. Uh, and we all thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask council if they have any direct questions. Um, uh, we're going to leave the finance piece out of this. This isn't a discussion on finance and, and uh, us making any kind of a commitment or contribution today. We'll take that under advisement. Thank you, Veronica. And uh, we've got budget uh, talks coming up in, uh, in the new year. Um, in January. So that can be an item that a counselor can bring forward at that time. But right now, what I'd like the questions to be is to you and uh, and James specifically about uh, what your organiz organization does or, or, or doesn't do and, and the benefits that you've already alluded to. So I'll open it up, uh, Council. If you've got some questions, I'll recognize you as they come up. Thank you. Councillor Smith, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor, and uh, welcome, Veronica. And I'm sorry, James. I missed James. Thank you. I'll change my name. Hang on. <laughs> rogue. <laughs> rogue yeah. is rogue. You're, you're um, <laughs> so um, I'm just curious as to, like, is this in conjunction with the destination marketing um, zone or the, is it the, um, with what you're doing? Is it part of, like, are you part of the cool small towns? What is sort of the, I've seen the video and I think it's fabulous what you've put together um, already. So I'm just curious as to how, how if, if High River hasn't had a, an, a more active role within the Foothills Tourism Group, what that looks like or how we become more entrenched, I guess, is for lack of a better descriptor. I, I can take that one, James. So Cool Little Towns was absorbed by Foothills Tourism Association in I'm pretty sure it was July, 2019. I have press releases I can share with you if you're interested. Um, so we own the logo and the photo assets and the name of Cool Little Towns. And I can show you on a map, but our region is Bragg Creek down to Nanton or just past, we do advertise for Trails and Beef. And then Kananaskis border on their Western edge to just past Okotoks. So everything in there, we've created some tours on our website. We have blogs about shopping in every region. And it's interesting to note that the Heartland tour is our most frequented page on our website. People just love touring and trying to find every single Heartland film set that they possibly can. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Walsh, please. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't find my voice. <laughs> thank you, Deputy Mayor, and thank you so much, Veronica and James, for, for coming and sharing this with us today. My question is very similar to what Councillor Smith has asked. Um, so is this a different program than uh, what we've seen previously? The, the representation that Foothills Tourism has um, done for the surrounding communities, um, 
I would like to see or know if uh, we're looking at the same type of thing. Um, is that an ongoing project or is this entirely separate? I mean, my first thought is you've done an amazing job um, east of, or west of us with uh, Turner Valley, Black Diamond, Nanton. We've seen lots of really good results from the work you've done. Um, is this a separate program that we're looking at uh, right now or is it part of that? You're, you're asking about the visitor information platform specifically? Yeah, I, I, I think I'm just not clear on, so what you're doing right now, this is uh, for, your, for the website to uh, help us gather information as to where the people are coming from? Right, this is in addition to, so uh, af when COVID began, um, we removed all membership fees because mm -hmm businesses just couldn't afford it. No one knew what was going on. Mm -hmm. So this was tied to an offering to encourage businesses to become members of the Foothills Tourism Association. Mm -hmm. And the request to municipalities has been ongoing from the inception of the association. So we've always put forth requests and asked for support. It's, um, it's mostly to maintain our operating costs and, and cash flow. Right. Uh, uh, let me redefine that. Is it uh, fair to say that our expectation would be this is for data that we can then implement? Or is this going to bring us also into one of the programs where um, the, the most recently the, the video that you did uh, it was in the last year that included all of the surrounding areas. Um, so this is separate than that. Uh, it, it's a resource for information, not uh, uh, a presentation to the media. Is that correct? Correct. So this okay. would be sort of hidden in the background, uh, the backside of the website. So everyone would need private access, membership access to this. And municipalities would, of course, receive that too. I, I'm not sure what the status of High River's Economic Development and Tourism Department is right now. I've sort of mm -hmm. lost touch over COVID with, with people in your administration, mm -hmm. but it, it does, it's an impressive amount of information, not just for business, but for municipalities, where to target, who is coming. It's really quite robust. And from what I remember from the initial presentation, High River was the second highest after Okotoks, well, third, I guess, if you count Foothills County. It was Foothills County, Okotoks, High River, Nanton in order of um, visitors. And then Turner Valley, Black Diamond were, were quite 4% of all visitors from Calgary region went to that area of the Foothills. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just to build on what Veronica said, um, you know, the foothills tourism industry deserve a lot of credit for the proactive reach out for the, the, the grant, the application. This is data that um, is hugely valuable, used by leading destinations around the world. Um, you know, we're talking New York City, we're talking San Francisco, we're talking Orlando, um, you know, uh, you know, just in the US and Canada, it's being used by Toronto, uh, Banff Lake Louise uses it. Um, you know, so so it's 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 really valuable data to help local businesses, but also municipalities make better decisions. Um, understanding, for example, you know, we had one client um, tell us, you know, geez, we didn't realize that people were coming uh, or were staying uh, on Monday. Like they they thought people were leaving on Sunday, and and they were actually staying on Monday, and their businesses are closed on Monday. <laughs> Um, and, and so just this kind of like, I mean, you think how simple and how basic this is, but think of the economic value of just keeping the stores open on Monday, maybe closing on Tuesday. Huh. <laughs> you know, um, these are kind of the insights that the data brings to you. And sometimes while, you know, one business might you know, register to that insight at a scale of, of, a, of a community or at the scale of an, you know, a region, that those insights are hard to see unless you have the data. Um, and of course, when you have the data, making those decisions are easier to make. They're made with confidence. And when they're easy and more confident, they happen faster. And that formula, that's the formula to accelerate the recovery out of, out of the pandemic. Um, so 
we certainly encourage the use of the data, not only for the businesses, but also the municipalities. Um, understanding the movement of people, the movement of tourism, where are people coming from, you know, is, is hugely valuable. Um, we had we had one county in New York. Um, so the state of New York uses this as well as, as a city. Um, they, there was a hotel a developer that was looking to invest in the region and, and build out a hotel. Um, they helped uh, they helped that developer with with all the data um, to better understand how to, you know, you know, just support their needs with the banks, the financing, things like that. So um, the data can be used in many, many different ways. Thanks for that, James. Um, Councillor Jones, you have a question, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have any idea of maybe percentage of the tourists that do come, how much data you get, like is it 50%, 15%? And also the $200 per business, does that give those businesses membership or are you still asking for membership fees on top of that? We'll let James answer the first question. I'll think <laughs> yeah, Verona, you can take the second question, but yeah, that, that's a, a really good question, Jenny. Um, you know, kudos uh, for catching on so quick. Um, so we don't capture every device in your destination. And we don't because if they don't have their phone on, we don't capture it. Um, you know, our, our data provider has a relationship with over 150,000 apps. Um, it's, it's a very big sample size, um, but, but it's not everyone, right? And, and some individuals choose not to share their data. They choose to only share the data when they're using the app. All of these variables kind of enter into play um, and, and are the reason why we don't capture every device ID. So, you know, it, it's not, um, we, we advise it not to be used as visitation data, but rather as a proxy for, you know, completed surveys. All right. So rather than having an intercept team on the ground, you know, asking visitors, oh, where did you come from today? Oh, and how long are you planning on staying? And where did you come from? You don't need to ask any of those questions. You're just getting that data because of the cell phone. And as long as you have a statistically significant sample size, then you're able to analyze it and understand, you know, increases, decreases, uh, you know, profile segments, behavior patterns, and things like that. Um, so to answer specifically your question, we have clients that have really tried to test the data set to understand, well, what percentage of the, you know, the real visitation are we capturing through this data set? And the number is usually somewhere around 10, 15%. Um, which may seem, wow, that's a really low number, but really, in fact, it's, it's, it's a very significant number when you look at the millions of device um, detected. So we know that within the Foothills data set that we're collecting, we're well, well north of the million mark. And so it's, it's, it's a really rich and robust data set that when you start to you know, look at it by time, by day, by region, by type of business, whether it be hotels or attractions or restaurants, or, or you know, whichever way you want to look at it, there's always kind of enough data there to be statistically significant in your analysis. Um, so we're really pleased actually when we do that. This was something that we do before we pull data on a region. It was we we try and understand what is the volume of data that we have, um, and 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 it was a very rich uh, data set. So that's that was really good news. Does that answer your question? And the, the second part, I was trying to formulate a, a really simple yes or no, but there isn't one. Um, so the way we operate, we try and draw people to the region. For example, in our, on our social media, Gary's Great Buys doesn't have a very strong social media presence, but Museum of the Highwood does. So we would end up sharing more of their content, but also encourage people to to branch out and go explore High River or the entire foothills in general. Um, the problem we were running into with membership, everyone want, they businesses believe that, you know, they'd pay their $200 or 100 or whatever the tier system was at the time. And they would get, let's say three social media posts, but cataloging that is quite difficult for one or two people. And the focus is coming to the region as opposed to a specific location, be it a business or a town. 
So this $200 to get access to the data was sort of a way to level the playing field and offer the same thing to all businesses, as opposed to making promises we cannot keep that you're going to get two to three posts per year or what have you. Did that, did I go too roundabout there? So, so there isn't an, another fee on top for each business? No, there is not. $200 would grant every business access to this data. Thank you. Council, any other questions at this time from our delegation? Seeing none, I'm going to extend our thanks again to Veronica and James for uh, joining us today for the information for the um, cost proposal that you provided to us. Like I said, we're going into budget discussion in the new year and uh, council is welcome to bring this forward at that time for consideration. So um, thanks guys, appreciate your time and uh, take care. Thank you so Thank much. You very much. Moving on to the next agenda item, folks, in our regular business, uh, 6.1 2022 interim operating budget. Uh, and we have uh, Liana joining us to present that. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Deputy Mayor and Council. I'm here today to present our interim operating budget. According to our MGA, we need to have a budget passed by December 31st for the following year, or we have to have an interim budget to allow us to continue operating. So what we administration has done is we have taken the total of the 2021 operating budget of $33,498,860 and applied 75% to allow us to continue operating until administration and council have an opportunity to do budget deliberations in January of 2022. So I am here if you have any questions. Council, pretty straightforward. We've got some work to do in January. Um, I'll say a lot of work to do in January, uh, but right now I'll, uh, I'll ask if anybody's got a, a question of Liana on this right now. Um, and if not, we'll just, I'll ask for a motion that we, uh, for, for uh, um, adopting our, our interim budget going into the new year. No questions, just looking for a hand now then to give me the motion. Thank you, Councillor Kinghorn. Call for the vote, and I can see everybody's hand if you want to be, if you want to be visual. Everybody knows what we're voting on interim budget. Excellent. One, two. I got to see Mr. Barton. There we go. Thank you. Uh, that's passed. A vote from everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Liana. And I think we Thank are um, we are keeping you on here. Um, uh, going to I am here a number of times. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> the contract award for the uh, external audit services, please. Thank you. So in October of 2021, uh, Avail LLP gave us a notice that we were, they were no longer available to offer our external audits uh, due to uh, capacity constraints. So administration prepared an RFP and went, left this open for approximately a month. And we received four responses to our uh, RFP, and we would like to award um, the RFP to BDO LLP Canada Limited, or LLP, sorry, not limited, on a three-year term with an option of two-year extensions, two one-year extensions. So if anybody has any questions, I'm here to answer those. Councillor Kinghorn, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Beard. Not really a question, just a comment. You know, sometimes when we change suppliers of certain things, it's it's uh, it's a good thing. Um, and uh, I'm actually in favor of us going ahead with this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kinghorn. Any other questions? No other questions, then I'm going to ask for a motion that Council authorize the proposal award for the external audit service contract 
for $127,250, excluding GST at administration fee for the period of 2021 to 2023 to BDO Canada LLP for external audit services. Councillor Kinghorn, thank you. All in favor? None opposed, the motion is passed, thank you. Moving to 6.3 um, contract award tree replacement and we'll be going to Kaylee on this one. Thank you, Kaylee. Good afternoon. I am here today to present the tree replacement uh, project award. The town received um, funding for replacing trees that were damaged during the 2013 flood. Um, we went out to request for a proposal to the public, um, to the public for this project and we received nine proposals so we had great turnout um, we were surprised by the value so we were able to get all the trees that we originally planned to plant so we're looking at planting 1500 trees throughout the community of high river um, of the nine proposals we received we did receive a proposal from five tr uh, star trees limited that will be able to meet the, the demands of the 1500 trees um, and within budget and so we are looking for council to move forward with allowing administration to award this contract. Was there any questions on this project? Uh, we do have a question. Councillor Smith, please. Thank you. Uh, my quick question is, does, that con does the contract award include any sort of follow-up on tree health or is it just the, the acquisition and planting of those trees? It's a really great question. The funding does only cover the cost of the planting of the trees. Um, and so the town is moving forward with purchasing um, something called a gator bag, which will help make it a little bit easier for us, but it will be our operating costs that will um, provide the care and maintenance to get these trees established. So the watering. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, council? Um, I've just got a couple things to add here. One thing was what Kaylee just mentioned about the gator bag. I, I learned about that today. And that's a water disbursement bag that goes at the base of the tree. Pretty cool. Didn't know what it was. Apparently they were around town this summer and I couldn't pay attention to anything but something else that was on the roadway. So anyway, um, that's the gator bag. And uh, I had a member of the community this weekend um, just contact me and say how pleased they were with the care and attention that our parks department gives our green spaces. Um, we've had some high wind events the last little while. And out of that, they, they deemed that we didn't have a lot of tree and branch loss. Uh, and they saw that as a testament as to how our staff take care of those green spaces for us. So I just wanted to give the team a shout out for everything that they do looking after all that green space that we do have in the community. So, um, from that, if there's no other questions to Kaylee, I'm going to ask for a motion for this resolution RC 188-2021. Uh, be it resolved that Council authorize the proposal award for the tree replacement project for $230,990, excluding GSD and contingency, to Five Star Trees Limited to supply and place to supply and place 1,500 trees throughout the town as per locations and specifications posted in the RFP. Looking for that motion, please. Councillor Barton, thank you. And call for the vote on that, folks. Unanimously passed. Thank you. Thank you, Kaylee. And 6.4, we're going to stay with Kaylee and the contract award for the Beechwood naturalization. And that's phase one of that project, the decommissioning portion. So go ahead, please, Kaylee. Thank you. Right. Um, this is, again, another project that we're wrapping up for the flood renewal projects. Um, this one was put out for tender um, and we received bids back. Um, it closed we, on November 18th um, and we received seven submissions. Um, this project was uh, put into two phases. So the first phase being the decommissioning um, and the second phase will come forward in the future, um, which will be the naturalization. Uh, we are looking to award the project 
uh, to East Butte, who submitted the most advantageous proposal to us. Um, and the goal is to begin construction. Um, let's see if we can give a little bit more information. This one is funded through the Southern Alberta Floodway Re uh, Relocation Program from the 2013 flood. Um, and it will include uh, decommissioning, so any of our infrastructure for our roads, our sidewalks, our sanitary lift station, and our deep, ut deep utilities. Was there any further questions on this phase in this award? Call for questions, guys. Anybody? Seeing none, uh, moving to the resolution is RC 189 2021. Uh, be it resolved that council authorize the award for the Beechwood naturalization phase one for the amount of 167,255 and 31 cents, excluding GST and including a 15% contingency to East Butte Contracting Limited to commence immediately with an anticipated completion end date of December 31st, 2020. If I could have that motion from the floor, please. Councillor Smith, thank you. Call for the vote, please. All in favor? Sorry, one sec. Thank you. Just flipping my screen. All good. Unanimous and passed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kaylee. Thank you. Uh, 6.4 Fleet Capital Budget Amendment. Uh, this is our tandem axle gravel truck, and Gary should pop up here to present this item to us today. Should be there. Hopefully everybody can see me. Uh, hello, Deputy Mayor and Council. Um, so as part of the 2021 capital budget, we were approved um, for a scheduled replacement of one of our tandem axle gravel trucks. Um, we went out for competitive RFP on this unit and we received five quotes back from various vendors. Um, through our evaluation process, we selected um, NOR Trucks, which is actually from Red Deer, um, as our preferred vendor. Uh, unfortunately, out of the five proposals that we received, not a single one of them was in budget. Um, but to kind of do this year, there's a major, as I'm sure most are aware, um, computer chip shortages and stuff this year, which has been adversely affecting all heavy equipment, heavy trucks, um, automotive industry, everything that way. So we've seen quite an increase in price and quite extended delivery times. Um, to make up the difference, we have a shortfall of just over $7,000. It was $7,350, I believe, total. Uh, that is what we are seeking approval and support to increase that budget and go ahead and award um, for purchase. Um, the overall budget shouldn't be impacted too bad. We did eliminate one unit um, from our fleet capital. So as far as the overall impact, we will still actually be um, under budget in our total fleet capital. It's just this one individual line um, item that like I say, we are looking for the increase in approval on. Thanks, Gary. Uh, appreciate that. Um, to council, is there any questions of Gary for this uh, increase uh, to, to the budget item? Councillor Smith, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. So quick question then. So the unit that's being replaced, uh, presumably the decommissioning of the existing one, Will that net some sort of offsetting factor that can be applied to that in a roundabout way? Yeah, absolutely. So that is, I guess, a couple of things in regards to the, the decommission of the old unit. Um, we are having a little struggle with just for parts and replacement for that unit right now, just because it is a, it's a sterling make and they don't make them anymore. So parts are getting a little um, scarce for them. But as far as resale, um, used equipment and trucks are selling really strong right now, again, in turn, because of uh, the shortage of new units. So yeah, there will absolutely be um, some funding coming back from that once we, we can sell. It's a little hard to put a number on it right now, just because um, 
we want to play with that time and, and market to sell a little bit and spring is a little better for that. Um, so we'll probably hold that truck till April, May before we marketed um, the old one. And I, you know what I mean? I would suspect we'll be, um, yeah, probably 15 to $25,000, maybe even better than that on, on sale on the other one. So it'll well cover the difference as well. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Smith. Thanks, Gary. Um, any other questions? I have I have one for for Chris. Um, just in regards of of uh, sale of an asset like that, can you just give Council um, the direction on where that fund, where those funds goes to, where those funds go to once they're received? Thank you. Certainly, typically the sale of our equipment will go back into general and then be reallocated by Council as they see fit in the subsequent budget year. So. Um, those, that's typically the, the response process. Um, and we're, we are working with an equipment reserve structure that we're trying to change a little bit um, to be, be more self-funding than, than it is currently. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, Council, we just have this item and another one coming up where um, that, that applies to. So I just wanted you guys to be, uh, to be aware when we do receive those funds where it goes to. So. Um, moving to this item, uh, budget amendment resolution RC 190-2021, uh, be it resolved that council approve the proposed purchase by increasing the budget uh, in the amount of $7,350 to purchase the tandem axle gravel truck. Looking for that motion from one of the councillors, please. Councillor Jones, thank you. And call for the vote. Please and thank you. And that's passed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Gary. Great stuff. Happy times with the gravel truck. Uh, moving to 6.6. .6, um, and Chief Zebedee with a uh, much bigger ask. Yeah, thanks for leading into that. Uh, afternoon, Deputy Mayor and Council. Uh, I come before you this, this afternoon to talk to you about a capital budget amendment for the replacement of our ladder truck. Um, currently, we operate a 2001 E1 75 foot, um, we call it a straight stick. Um, it is typically slated for a service life of 20 years, according to FUS and NFPA. Um, we do have the ability to extend over five years. And that was the original plan was to extend it to, um, to the five-year maximum life cycle on it. A uh, unique opportunity has come up from one of our vendors um, in a something that we've never seen or I've never seen anyways in, in my career where a vendor has uh, basically leased on an apparatus and the vehicle was then returned back to the vendor after a year of lease on it. Um, so paying down a bunch of the depreciated value on the, on the apparatus. Um, the apparatus that we're looking at is a 2020 Pierce 100 foot mid mount platform, which is a little bit different um, than our current apparatus and that it gives us an extra 25 feet of reach, as well as has a platform on the end of it. And what I mean by a platform is basically a basket that has um, nozzles and a spot for the firefighters to operate out of when they're when they're using it. Um, and the kind of the, some of the increases the things that it does for us is it offers us the ability um, to operate off the platform doing vertical ventilation, whereas now we actually have to get off the, onto a roof structure. Uh, this truck gives us the ability to basically put the platform kind of down close to the roof, make any cuts or any of those sorts of things that we may need. Um, the other option or advantage that it does give us with this truck with the platform is in the event of needing to rescue um, elderly. Uh, that's always been one of our biggest concerns is how do we get them out of those second, third floor windows. Um, with our current apparatus, it's actually bringing them down the ladder. This would be able to put them in a platform and lower it down to the ground um, in, a, in a safe manner. Um, the truck that we are looking at is a little bit smaller than the conventional ladder trucks. Uh, this is a mid-mount design, so it shortens up our wheelbase by about, or our overall length by about nine feet um, in comparison to a rear mount, which is what we currently operate now. And uh, as well as that being mid-mount, it also lowers the height of the apparatus uh, by about a foot and a half in comparison to a rear mount conventional. So when we start talking about our streets and, and developments and things like that, 
um, that's definitely a concern for us is being able to get in there and, and effectively move our, our apparatus through. So um, the basically the idea behind the procurement of this would be through a, a company called um, Canoe Procurement Group, which is formerly RMA. Um, so they have gone out and done all the tendering on our behalf. Um, we have posted on APC that we would be using procure or Canoe Procurement Group, and uh, we would then follow their procurement um, contracts through their their systems that they've they've already set up through RMA, which is now Canoe, Canoe Procurement Group. Um, the truck is available and uh, we could have delivery of the truck probably end of January if it was approved. Um, the old ladder truck would be held on to until such time as the new one was put into place and uh, would then be sold at that time uh, once the new truck was put into service. Is there any questions? Doesn't look like, oh, there we go. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Go ahead. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I seem to be the question asker today or one of them for sure. Um, can you explain for us, please, the, um, I guess, the sticker price on, an, on a brand new versus the screaming deal that we're hopefully going to get here as far as what that looks like, please? Absolutely. So um, the exact same spec truck, if we were to spec it today and order it from the manufacturer, would be in and around the 1.96575 mark, something like that with current exchange um, and increases in some of the prices that they've seen. Um, this one is coming in at uh, the, the price of the truck is coming in at 1.395. Um, so it's fairly significant savings. There is other options out there for apparatus, which would put us at lower, uh, a lower amount, and that would be going with the rear mount. But then we end up getting into apparatuses, which are like 48 to 49 feet long and nearly 12 feet tall, which is one of the things that we wanted to try and steer, steer away from. Um, you know, roughly something around that would be around the 1.5 to 1.6 mark. Thank you, Chief. Uh, going on to Councillor Kinghorn, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. I, I, I've got a lot of questions, really. Um, how many calls have we had to use that fire truck or the ladder truck in, say, the last year? Yeah, so I, I kind of ran some reports on that. Um, and in the last, I think I did it was five years five years or four years, we ran uh, 105 calls in the last five years where that truck was utilized. And whether that would be from uh, an aerial waterway, you know, an elevated master stream, ventilation, or even getting up onto roof access for an alarms. Our ladder truck is, is kind of a versatile piece when it comes to um, even alarm calls. And we get HVAC units on the top of the, you know, the provincial building downtown um, to get us up there real quick. This one does offer up a little bit of more versatility than our current truck, whereas it has anchors for um, a Stokes basket on it. So if you get a worker that's working on a roof somewhere that gets injured, um, which we have had, we can actually put the a Stokes basket or a, a massive plastic basket that we could load the victim into and actually secure them onto the platform to lower them down. Um, with our current apparatus, we don't have that uh, that ability to, to do so, that. But to go back, Cody, you're saying that we needed that fire truck on 105 calls over the last five years? Yep. Okay. Um, the current fire, the current truck we have, um, it wasn't really clear, but will it do the job for the buildings that we have today? So it, it does. Um, now where we run into some of our struggles is the actual positioning of it. Um, so you look at uh, Ramada and Seasons Retirement Home. Um, there's areas of that building that uh, given the length of our ladder that we can't actually stage it close enough to reach some of the uh, areas. Um, to give you an example, like the Ramada, um, we can just hit the very uh, eve of the building when we're parked right beside it. Um, so we get a, a, a fire that's running in the roof space of that building. Um, we're going to have a really tough time getting up and above to get the water down on top of it. Because then a lot of our buildings aren't sprinklered into the uh, attic spaces. Some are now with the new code, but uh, some aren't in the community. Do you think that there will be a five, would be a five year extension on the existing one, or is that uh, unlikely, likely? 
I think that it is very likely, um, given that we are very prudent with our maintenance and documentation on the apparatus. I do believe that FUS would give us the, the extension um, for the next five years. Thank you. Council, any other questions? Councillor Jones, please go ahead. Um, I think in there you state the maintenance of the truck you have is about $7,000. Is that including insurance? Like it would, as the older the truck becomes, does insurance increase? Uh, good question. Um, no, so that just is the annual maintenance that, that is typically done on it. Um, and with the newer apparatus, we can now switch from a yearly, um, they call it a non-destructive testing where they test all the welds and fittings. Um, we can now lessen that a little bit. So the dollar amount would probably be a bit less than that, but that $7,000 includes our non-destructive testing, uh, oil changes on the aerial apparatus, greasing, cleaning, um, checking cables, all of that sort of stuff, which is required by uh, the National Fire Protection Association. Not seeing any other questions. So I'm gonna jump in. Um, Chief, in regards to, you know, future development and whatnot of High River, I know that's always crystal ballish, but um, with a new unit like this, we very much cover ourselves on, on a lot of development that would go forward, right? Um, as you stated, we've got some positions uh, where you guys go out on calls that the current vehicle is not, it suffices, um, but there's, um, if you had your choice, this piece would better serve the safety and security of the community. Yeah, is that absolutely. A fair enough assessment. That is a that's a really fair assessment, and that was one of the big things for us um, in looking at this truck is that it does meet the needs now, but into the future as well. Um, you start talking 10, 15 story buildings. Codes then start to take over to provide fire protection for those higher elevated places in those buildings. Whereas when you're sticking around the four or five story mark, that's kind of where our ladder trucks really come into place. And then we start looking at our new developments with the um, high intensity housing where we're, we're stacking them really close together. Um, you know, in a truck like this, having the increased water flows with a 2000 gallon per minute pump um, just gives us that much more flow rate to, to help stop fire again with more um, versatility in the length of the ladder to get in the backside of houses or maybe cover a couple houses versus what we have now. Right. Yeah. That was another point was, was the, um, yeah, the, the mo mobility and the versatility when you get into say a cul-de-sac situation or whatnot. Right. Absolutely. Um, okay. Um, uh, m my opinion, folks, it's it's um it's a, it's a lot of money. Um, we have money within the, the MSI reserve that we are not going to the rate payers to cover this off. Um, it's a safety and security piece, obviously, for the community. Um, I think, from everything that I understand and know about this, it, it's it's a it's a deal. Um, we would be rolling the dice going forward. I know we've talked about these five, the five year extension. Um, I, I'm in support of this right now, but I've got a couple of counselors with hands up as well, and uh, we can go through those, and then uh, and then we can have some further discussion and call for the questions. So, uh, Councillor Kinghorn, please. Uh, thank you again. So, my understanding when I reviewed the land use bylaw, our land use bylaw is in place that we won't have these high structures uh, allowed without a variance within the new communities. Is that a fair statement? Okay, and then my next question to the funding model is to Chris. Um, we're talking about taking this from our uh, MSI funding. Did we not have someplace else where that money was already allocated or is this new MSI or, and, and do we have any sort of sense from the province what MSI funding is gonna look like going forward in 2022 or 23 actually for that matter? Thank you. So I'll ask Leanna to answer the question about the MSI. She's got all the details on our reserve accounts from that perspective, Councillor Kinghorn. Well, Councillor Kinghorn through Deputy Mayor uh, Nychuk, um, right now in our MSI capital for what we have 
unallocated, we have $1.9 million that we haven't committed. Well, also what we all have within our gas tax fund, we have $3.4 million of non-committed funds. We are going to be bringing back to you our 10-year capital plan within the budget deliberations. And at this point, we normally do not bring back a capital plan that is not funded. We have been told with MSI, we are looking at that there's funding is going to stay for 2022, potentially 2023. And then there will be a new grant called the Local Government Fiscal Framework that will be uh, replacing the MSI capital. Um, and that will be roughly around the same amount of the MSI capital. Of course, this is all due to uh, provincial government budget allocation. So my crystal ball is saying right now, it's going to stay similar. Um, but it, once again, it is a crystal ball picture and I can only give you the information that I have been given by the government of Alberta. Um, thank you, uh, Leanne, I appreciate that. I have trouble when we talk about adjusting um, budgets like this midstream. It's, it's a big, big chunk of money. Um, I would have much rather seen it come forward in the, the new capital budget that's coming out in January, but I understand there's probably a time constraint on the availability of this truck. Um, I'll think about it a little more. Maybe council's got some more questions for you. Thank you. Thanks, and, Councillor Kinghorn. Uh, Deputy Mayor Nychuk, if I can respond to that. Yes, and it's a unique opportunity. Um, this truck has been spoken for by a community in BC that failed to meet the obligations and we were um, we had stated an interest in it so they brought it out and demoed it for our crew and for some members of council that that had um, showed up that day um, and it became available and and so that's why you're seeing it now typically you're, you're correct council came arm we don't like to make these types of purchases midstream uh, we want to go through the proper budget deliberations but it is certainly a unique opportunity that um, deserves to be at the council table and let council make the decision how best to approach that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just one last question. Cody, I'm not going to be around in 20 years. I hope this truck is still going to be here, right? This is like a 20 year truck we're talking. Absolutely. Yeah. The plan is for, for a 20 year truck, just like our current apparatus that we have right now. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, um, just before I get to you, Councillor Smith, I know Councillor Barton had his hand up previously, and I just wanted to recognize if, if he did want to take that opportunity to jump in or um, if the moment was fleeting and just went by. No, I, I, I do have a question. I was going to ask uh, uh, Chief if uh, G70, if, the, if currently our fire department looks after Cargill and how that would assist us in that particular situation if we do look after them. Absolutely, Councillor Barton. Um, so we do have a mutual aid agreement um, or an agreement, if you would, with Foothills County and Cargill does fall within our first response district to the Cargill uh, meat packing plant. We go right up to 434 Avenue. So basically the old magnesium plant. So all of that whole strip of, of commercial is in our first response district that we would be responsible for. Um, and actually one of the most recent calls that we, we used our ladder truck for was a fire at uh, two of the businesses out there um, recently. So um, it would be utilized there as a first due for an aerial apparatus um, at any of that business district in the county. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Barton. Uh, on to Councillor Smith, please. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, so another quick question for you, Chief, is um, if we're looking at replacing this truck now, uh, I know we touched on it when we were there for the tour, but can you, for the benefit of Council, sort of outline the remaining vehicles and sort of, I think there's also a schedule of replacement over time, uh, what that kind of looks like as far as any additional or replacement vehicles that will be required in the near or not so near future. Thanks. Yeah, that, absolutely. I'd have to look at the capital plan, but I believe we have one of our smaller vehicles slated for 2023. Um, but any of our larger apparatuses aren't due until, um, I want to say it's 2028, which will be a unit that is currently 50-50 uh, spread between the county and the town, our own 
by both. Um, that would be the next engine that would be coming up due. Um, and everything else is uh, would be 2031 and then 2026 would be the, the next, um, or sorry, 2031 and 2036 would be the next units that would come up. Uh, to, to follow up to Councillor Smith, if I can jump in, um, on those that are scheduled for replacement, is there any life extension on those? So we, we've got a life expectancy window, but like this ladder truck we have now, there could be a five-year extension on those other pieces. Is there that same opportunity? Yeah, and one of the uh, interesting pieces that we, we have the ability to do is, um, is through FUS, through the fire underwriters, actually give a five-year extension to an apparatus. Um, however, we have to be very gentle with that extension, being that each community is only allowed to have one extension at a time. So you couldn't have two or three apparatus with five-year extensions on them. You were allowed to have one apparatus during a five-year span um, for that. So again, if you put it on one truck and the next truck was due in, in you know, within that five-year cycle, we would have to make a decision at that point. Um, but yeah, so any of them are able to be extended. Um, and uh, for the five years, it's just, we have to be careful with the extensions. Thanks, Chief. Yeah, just, just looking at opportunities, uh, if, if council deems fit to go ahead with something like this, what the um, opportunities to flex our capital spending going forward in the next few years are, um, you know, to Councillor Kinghorn's point, this is, this is a big spend. Um, it's, a, it's a unique opportunity we have that uh, uh, based on the, on the new value and the purchase price of this unit, it's a, you know, it's a $600,000 savings. Um, uh, I, I think it looks pretty pretty promising, but that's uh, here for council to decide. So the more information we have, the better. So thanks for that piece there. Uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you. Uh, one more additional question then, I guess. Um, are there any other significant asset replacements that the town will be requiring in the next year or two that we can anticipate, and I guess that's a question for Chris or Leanna or, or Kaylee or Riley, as far as anything that, that you can foresee that will require a significant investment as it stands. Um, through the deputy mayor to yourself, Councillor Smith, um, there's always stuff that we can fix. Um, there's always stuff that's breaking. Um, it's just the nature of infrastructure and facilities that we own and operate. Um, significant expenses would be projects similar to aquatics facility expansion or a new rec facility, um, new sewer treatment plant, new water plant. Both, um, both water treatment plant and sewer treatment plant are on the plan in some time in the future. Sewer treatment plant is sooner than later. Um, and we are going through a pilot program right now of design with hopefully construction in 2023 or 2024. Um, and that would be funded partially through offsite levies as well as from general taxation and utility rates, not general taxation. Um, and same with the water, water fund, it gets funded through utility rates, not general taxation. Um, and so there, we try and make, maintain them as self-funding funds over time. Um, and we're getting to that point, but there's always stuff that we can fix, always stuff that we can add new value to, or always new infrastructure that we can build that will um, add to quality of life within the community and better levels of service. Um, be it a pedestrian bridge, be it um, a new new vehicle bridge, um, there are all those projects that are out there um, and timing wise is gonna be dependent on financing and, and the will of the community to, to pay for some of those. Thank you. I appreciate it. it's a bit of a crystal ball question, but by the same token, uh, you know, this is a this is a fairly significant uh, offering at this point in our you know pre budget and end of year and all of that. It it is, and it's a difficult decision. You know, the chief and myself have talked about this. It's a great opportunity to have in front of us. Um, difficult decision to make when we're so close to our budget cycles, um, and. And we are trying to rebuild that 10 year capital plan for council as well. So that's more reflective of actually what's on the ground and what needs to be actually fixed. Um, and, but this is one of the pieces of equipment that in the next five years certainly would have to be replaced. Um, and, 
And uh, even if we got the five-year extension, we'd have to start planning for it now um, and start putting money away now for that uh, eventual purchase, which crystal ball gazing could be anywhere from the 1.5, 1.6 million up to the $2.2 million range. Um, and so that's why it's a unique opportunity um, that we are taking advantage to at least get it to the council table and let council make the choice. Um, and, and we feel that it's a good price. We feel that it's a good piece of equipment. We feel that it suits us for the next 20 to 25 years. Um, and we feel that it, it's the right choice for this community at this time. Thank you, Chris. Uh, for, for council um, earlier in some discussion today, just to give you guys a frame of reference, in 2001, we bought the current ladder truck. In 2001, it was $600,000. Um, so in, in 20 years, we've gone from a $600,000 piece of equipment new to a almost $2 million piece of equipment that serves the same purpose. So to give you an idea of escalating costs, that's just a, another financial tidbit to chew on um, while we're discussing this. So um, things aren't getting any cheaper. We all know that in our daily lives. And, and uh, um, I think this is presenting a good opportunity, but uh, it's for us to discuss here and decide on. So if anybody else would like to jump in at this point, um, please do so. Minute to reflect. Mr. Kinghorn, Councillor Kinghorn, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Nychuk. Um, Thanks for the presentation, Cody, and the explanation, Chris. I think you both have, have, have really uh, dug deep into this and brought it forward with a lot of consideration. Um, I'm going to support the motion because I, I, I believe in your arguments, and I think what you're um, proposing for the town is probably the best option uh, we have going forward. Um, I do. The only question I have is, you know, the truck's going to be two years old coming up when we by the time we get it um is there technology and stuff that would be available in five years time that you would per want to have that's not available today maybe maybe not um i get it you're kind of going out on a, a bit of a gamble here too so appreciate all the information and and yes i'll be supporting this motion thank you thank you councillor kinghorn any other councillors with comment question opinion all right we'll move to the resolution then resolution rc 191 2021 uh be it resolved that council approve a budget amendment not to exceed 1.45 million for the purchase of a 2020 pierce 100 foot mid mount ascending area aerial tower ladder truck if i can have that mouthful as a motion please Councillor Kinghorn, thank you. Look to council for the vote, please, for the question. All in favor? Thank you, just switching my page. Approved unanimously. Thank you very much, council. Chief, still thank you for your time. Up in it. I'm still not going up in it, no how. We'll set you up a ride, Councillor Kinghorn. When it comes, it's January, Jamie, and it's going to be minus 40, and we're taking a ride. No. Get that get that balloon hat on. We're going. No. I just hope you never yeah, need yeah. a ride in it, Jamie. Yes. Cheers to that. It's just like riding in a uh, balloon. Who? <laughs> Appar apparently not, according to Councillor Kinghorn. There's a big no there. Um, all right. Thank you very much, Council. Uh, good discussion, um, and I believe a really good decision for our community, so thank you. Uh, moving to 6.7, external board and committee reappointments. Uh, Kieran, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, Deputy Mayor and Council. Every year, Council considers the approval of the proposed Town of High River Board and Committee citizen reappointments. Having Council ap approve these Town of High River Board and Committee citizen reappointments allows administration to keep the boards and committees at the capacity needed to function. In accordance with Section 145 of the Municipal Government Act, a Council may establish and appoint such committees as Council determines necessary. Should Council choose to approve the Town of High River Board and Committee Citizen Reappointments, administration will inform the applicants of Council's decision and update our records accordingly. The reappointment 
appointments are as follows. Tom Sale to the Community Futures Highway Board for a three-year term ending in November 22, 2024. Bill Zerwell to the High River Regional Airport Board for a three-year term ending November 1, 2024. And Gary Jones to the High River Regional Airport Board for a three-year term ending November 1, 2024. Please note that the reappointments of Bill Zerwell and Gary Jones reflect the motion for these reappointments that was passed by the Foothills County to the High River Regional Airport Board on December 8, 2021 at their council meeting. I'm now open to answer any questions council may have. Looking to council for any questions for Kieran. No questions. Then I'll ask for the motion for resolution RC 192-2021, be it resolved that council approve the proposed Town of High River Board and Committee citizen reappointments for November 1st, 2021 to October 31st, 2022. Tom Sales to Community Futures for a three-year term ending November 22nd, 2024. Bill Zerowell to the High River Regional Airport Board, three-year term ending November 1st, 2024 and Gary Jones to the High River Regional Airport Board, three-year term ending November 1st, 2024, and that council direct administration to advertise openings for the remaining vacancies on the town of High River boards and committees and return to council at a future date with recommendations. Can I have that motion, please? Councilor Jones, thank you. Those four. Unanimously approved. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Much appreciated. Uh, 6.8 going to our CAO, Chris Prosser, Strategic Priorities Chart and Work Program, if you don't mind, sir. No problem, Deputy Mayor Nychuk. So thank you for the opportunity to present this to you. I'll be a little bit longer than I than previous presentations. Um, just to give the count, the, the public a frame of um, the process or frame the process that council went through over two days. Um, so the proposed recommendations before council today is it sets the agenda and, and sets the priorities for the next 12 to 18 months, maybe a little bit longer than that, depending what comes off the list and what moves around. Um, the whole goal here is to ensure accountability, make sure that progress is taking place. And that it's a common logical common sense approach with actions that that council sees on a regular basis. Um, the new chart, will be the focus of staff's time and attention and is intent to be um, have clear direction with simple actionable steps and, and accountability. Um, and I'm gonna stress the whole concept of about accountability throughout this, cause that's, that's the whole goal. Um, all the priorities, uh, I need to be clear, all the priorities have financial impacts. Um, ultimately, there's gonna be some dollars put out there, be it a new recreation center, aquatic expansion, whatever it may be. Um, at, in addition to the staff time that's dedicated to seeing them those through. Um, we want to make sure that council is aware of that and, and the timing of our, and why we pushed the budget into January was that we wanted to have this priority setting session first so that we had council's priorities and weren't guessing um, as we started to put dollars to pass council's priorities. And we want to make sure that we had dollars allocated to this council's priorities. Um, as part of the implementation process for, for this priority chart, um, we will be having four quarterly meetings and they'll be twofold, they'll be dual purpose. One, firstly, the check-in to make sure how we're doing, um, make sure we're doing well, make sure we're communicating well between all the parties involved um, and making sure that we're meeting the expectations. The second part will be the update, the strategic priorities. How is progress taking place? Are we getting things done? What roadblocks have we hit? Um, and those types of challenges that are before us. The dates for those strategic quarterly meetings are set within the report, but are March 30th, June 29th. I know that's just before summer break and before the, May, the July long weekend, so I apologize for that, um, but there's a method to the madness on that one. September 28th, um, as well as December 14th. Um, all are on Wednesday, so we're trying to break it up so that we don't conflict with regular council meeting days. Um, we, we know that, that, takes, that those types of weeks are quite busy. Now, the top five priorities as council voted on and, and we unpacked over those two days include the following priorities. No numerical order whatsoever, no priority whatsoever, but Riverside Drive and Hyden Park, the sale of those properties back to the general public. And we're looking for January to have the sales strategy 
and hopefully rolling that out in later in the winter or early part of the spring. Town plan terms of reference for the task force as well as the RFP to finalize with the start date of that to be January. And we're hoping to start the public engagement process in early in the spring. Um, recreation facility council direction. Um, sometime in February, we'll be bringing back reports to the council of all the past reports, outlining the history of what's been done, what locations have been looked at, and determining what the next steps are. Maybe there is no further action, or maybe there's a desire to reinvigorate the aquatic expansion or to take a look at a brand new site in a collaborative manner with, with the county. Um, the Northwest Pedestrian Bridge location, we're, we're in the process of that for having this location finalized by March with the feasibility. As part of the budget process that we get into in early January, we'll see a, um, a work program for a very extensive engagement program with the public. We want to make sure we're engaging both First Nations communities as well as our local residents to, to make sure we're getting the location right. The previous work that we've done, we've done very little engagement and it's been kind of out there on its own from that perspective. And then finally, community, uh, community connection proposal is really looking at increased engagement, increased communication, um, bringing that volunteerism, reconnecting the community post COVID, increasing socialization, um, those types of concepts probably ties in nicely with the event, destination event and marketing or, and targets that's later on in the agenda or later on in this list. In addition to those top five, there are seven next priorities. And those seven next priorities include business attraction, clarifying what our role actually is. Are we the ones doing the marketing? Or are we the ones just providing funding or support um, for the Chamber of Commerce um, and having that conversation? Transportation plan review. Um, how do we integrate active transportation and more bike lanes within our vehicle framework as well? Um, is that something we want to invest in? And, and how do we improve that linkages to our communities to the north, to the south? Three-year capital plan. We've just talked about that with the ladder truck. This is the three-year capital plan. We do want to get you thinking beyond three years. Um, so we're going to work hard to get those priorities for the three years, as well as frame what the ten, next 10 years is going to look like. Um, water source protection. Um, uh, we want to make sure that we have good standards in place. Our aquifer is underneath our feet throughout this community. We want to make sure it's protected. We want to make sure that it's not contaminated and it's there for the long term. That ties in nicely with our long term water strategy, how we're going to use our water resources, how we're going to uh, lend that to the regional context, if we're if we find to lend it, lend it to the regional context or not. Um, and, and what does that look like with growth? Destination events, we talked about this quite a bit in, in the petition delegation, the strategy and targets, setting those strategy and targets, what that looks like, what is our role? Um, are we active? Are we a catalyst? Um, are we supporting community groups, having that conversation? And that'll be later, later in the summer once um, something comes off the list. And of course, the big ticket item, again, ties into the capital priorities, asset management. Um, asset management is, the buzzword across the country, and this is taking a look at our policy review and making sure we're aligned in the philosophy throughout the organization from council right through to people on the, on the ground um, doing condition assessments. Now, I wanna be clear, this chart does not detract us from doing the day-to-day -day stuff. You know, law enforcement still has to take place. Council meetings still have to be prepared. We still have those scuds, I term them scuds that come in from left field that we have to address, um, be it um, tumbleweeds in a neighborhood or leaves falling from a park space. Um, we've got we've got those scuds that we have to deal with. Um, so we still have to do our day-to-day -day work, and but we still need to have focus on success and strategic success over the long term um, to provide progress for the community. Council's options: Council can adopt the pros work chart, uh, short-term pri or strategic priorities chart and work program with the follow-up action list. They could choose not to and decide to send this back to Cal and have a further conversation about what's, pro what's important, what's not important. Um, or we can just simply refer it back to Cal for further conversations. And we had targeted that, but we felt that we were quite comfortable after circulating that it was good to get it to the regular media council for adoption. So Deputy Mayor, that's the rationale for the recommendation that's before council tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, appreciate that very much. Um, to council, does anybody, I, I know, um, and I thank you for all the work that went into our, our, our strategic priority sessions and, and the outlay of this. Um, uh, we spent a lot of time on it, but do we have any uh, further questions from Chris at this time? I see Councillor Kinghorn had his hand up, so I'll recognize him first and then take any other questions. You're okay? 
Fantastic. Any other questions from the floor of Chris right now? I, I think we're pretty well versed in this right now. And um, again, thanks to everybody for their hard work on putting this together so we can go forward to um, with administration on the next four years and beyond. So um, that being said, I see no hands up for any questions. I'll move to this resolution RC 193-2021. Be it resolved that Council adopt the, strate the Strategic Priorities Chart, Follow-up Action List, and Work Program dated November 19th, 2021, as presented. Councillor Kinghorn, thank you. Call for the question. In favour? Unanimously passed. Thank you. Um, that was the last piece of business. I'll move to public comments. Uh, Jody, if we have any anything there. After nope, we've gone nothing has the meeting. come in. Nothing has come okay. in, thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, moving to council correspondence. Um, everybody had a chance, I'm assuming, as you did with the regular agenda to look through that. Um, I'll just uh, bring a couple points up of uh, importance, in my opinion. Um, the letter from our Minister of Municipal Affairs regarding the extension on the, uh, uh, the infrastructure funding um, for the repairs we're doing to the curling rink and small ice slab that we got the extension there to finish that project up. Um, a couple other pieces there. Um, in regards to, as Council has discussed, uh, relationships and partnerships with other municipalities, I would, uh, if you haven't read the couple of letters uh, in 8.5 and 8.6, I'd ask that you have a look at those and coming to next Cal meeting just for us to have a little bit of discussion on that uh, and other things that might lead from that particular item topic. But uh, just carrying forward that discussion on, on relationships, I think it's prudent that you guys have a look and read those and that we follow up with it at the next Cal meeting. Um, other than that, I have one piece of community business. There uh, are some members in our community that are concerned about um, our provincial ambulance service. They are holding a meeting tonight at 7 p.m. at uh, the Legion. Uh, so uh, those of you that are watching virtually community members, there are a group of community citizens that uh, are, are discussing the current situation in Alberta, I um, also want the community to know that we are very well versed in those challenges and we've been advocating as a municipality along with Foothills with uh, the municipality of Okotoks um, who took a letter of concern to AUMA recently that we supported. Um, we've been advocating for improvement to that situation for some time now and we'll continue to do that. Uh, hopefully our MLA makes himself present for that meeting tonight to listen to the concerns of our uh, our provincial constituents here. Um, and on that note and that little piece of information, I will uh, call for adjournment unless there's any opposition at 4.22 p.m. Councillor Jones, we'll just hold that adjournment until you go ahead. Thank you. No? She was just waving. She was just saying hi. Or maybe was it was bye. Yeah, that was a mistake. I apologize. Oh, no, no, that's that's fine. Um, I am going to add one more thing. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to everybody, because we won't see those of you out there in virtual land. We won't see you till the new year. Um, so be safe, be happy, enjoy your time uh, with family and friends if you can. And uh, we're adjourned, 422. Thanks, all. Excellent job, Michael. Merry Christmas. Thanks, Thank guys. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone.